Okay, well, thank you for tuning in to the Okinawa Karate Podcast. I'm Josh Simmers, coming to you from the home of uh, karate, Okinawa, Japan. Sitting here with my friend Ben Ayers, the Kilted Karateka. We're at the Okinawa Karate Kai Con in Tomigusku, so there might be some people bouncing around the back doing kata and whatnot. Uh, but Ben, I want to say thank you very much for sitting down with me today. No, thank Take you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Get a little bit of your, your information, your story, your background. Hmm. Um, just an update, or not an update, but an intro of Ben. We met, I think it was about one year ago, Yep. Um, here in Okinawa. Uh, you were part of the Okinawa Karate Nerd Program. That's right. And I want to say it was a Friday night when I first met you and the rest of the karate nerds. You were at Higa Sensei's Dojo up in Yomitan, showed, practicing some Shogun Ryu yep. with James Pankovich from the Dojo Bar. Mm -hmm. And we had finished our normal class on a Friday night with Kian Sensei. And he said, come on, we got to go over to... Higa Sensei's dojo, he wants to introduce us to some foreigners that are here, mm -hmm. okay? And we got over there, and you, and uh, I think Max was, Max there. was there. Jose. Uh, Jose, yep. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember who else as well. Uh, Francois was yes, there as Yes, well. that's yeah. right, yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And we showed each other some kata. I think mm -hmm. I did Pasai with Jeff mm -hmm. from the dojo, uh, from um, Children of Your Dojo. You did Pasai next to James, I believe. That's right, yep. And then uh, I want to say it was that same night we had headed out to the Izakaya. It is, yes. Yep. Yeah. Had a few beers, um, ate some food, and then... Higa Sensei got on the sand Yeah, Yep, yep. Chon Chon Yes, Very good yes. song, yeah. Had to sing along. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a few weeks later in this same room, we were both mem uh, attending the Cyber Budo yes, yeah. seminar. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's uh, right. Terry Wingrove uh, Sensei. Yes. Great seminar. Mm -hmm. Then after that, of course, become friends online like everybody does. I started mm. following your blog and mm -hmm. took an interest in it. And actually, I don't know if you know this, but you were maybe the first or, or one of the first people that I told mm. that I was going to start the Okinawa Friday podcast. Yes. It, yeah, yeah, we okay, texted cool. each other back and forth, and I knew that you were going to be coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to get you on the show mm. and get uh, your recording here. So here we are today. So awesome. thank you very much. And I'm going to hand it over to you, man. Let's okay. start out. Your history, where you started, up okay. to present day, if you don't mind. Okay. And I'll interject some questions or little bits here and there. Cool, man. Cool. Uh, okay, so I guess I should, you know, I'm Scottish, so um, uh, I born and bred in Scotland in an area called Aberdeen, which is in the northeast of Scotland. And um, ever since a young age, uh, I've been fighting. Uh, unfortunate, of course. Uh, I grew up thinking that was a part of life in, in Scotland um, to fight. I was fighting in nursery, in primary school, in secondary school. Um, so I guess that was my, my main training, <laughs> if you will. Um, and I didn't start formal karate training until I was about seven or eight years old. But a friend of mine, he would go to the dojo, he would learn Shotokan karate. Um, but he would also watch Bruce Lee movies, which he would then lend to me. We would both watch the movies together, and then usually, nearly every day, weather permitting, we'd find a space behind the school canteen where we'd practice fighting each other, right? And then, of course, there was also real fights, which aren't so good, you know? But he introduced me to my first sensei, um, Brian Bothwell, um, sensei, who has a long history of practicing uh, from the J Japanese Karate Association. He, okay. His teachers were Anoida sensei, Kanazawa sensei, and, um, yeah, and, and Kaze sensei. So my teaching, my, my first in, uh, introduction to karate was uh, Budo karate, essentially. Um, and I was never really interested in doing kata. I was never interested in grading. I think I stayed as a white belt for about five years, six mm -hmm. years. I just didn't want to grade. I just wanted to fight. That's mm -hmm. what I enjoyed the most, you know? It wasn't until I got to my late teens, I stopped fighting, which was really good. I found a much more peaceful way to resolve conflicts. And I started to really enjoy uh, Kihon practice. That okay. was my main practice there. So I started to get more interested in the technical side and developing my strength and power. Um, it wasn't until I did Teki Shodan, so Naihanshi Shodan, mm -hmm. that I fell in love with Kata. Okay. And that's where that started. So leading up to this point, mm -hmm. <clears throat> of before doing Kihon and Kata, you mm -hmm. literally, it was just kumite or sparring or... Well, this what? is what's interesting. I would literally do Yes, a, a safer version of a safe version of kumite, if you will, in the dojo. Okay. I mean, I think I did one competition once. I was ten years old, and I was fighting sixteen-year-old brown belts. And this was still at the time when it was optional if you wanted to wear protection. Okay. You know, so I didn't wear protection. I just enjoyed fighting. Yeah. You know, but my sensei, he didn't like competition. In fact, he believed in bringing up karateka who could defend themselves essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And what I would say is that the training was very difficult. It was very hard, very hard mentally and physically. Like he was trying to build our spirit, you know. So, but he was okay with you at that time, being a fighter. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because he also he's also Scottish. He yeah. grew up in a time in Scotland which was probably more violent than I grew yeah. up. Scotland still has a reputation as being a violent place, yeah. and it is still in some some instances, you know. So that very much defines the karate practice yeah. that I had. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Mm. So you, you had some steam to blow off, I guess. Yes, <clears throat> a lot of it. Got that worked out a little bit into your teen years, mm -hmm. um, and then you took a liking to the Captain Kihon. Why? What what's, what changed? Do you know, I think it was because I could learn how to let off that steam that I had in the kata. I could express myself using the kata. I guess when I was younger, I never took an interest in kata, and perhaps I found it too difficult to remember. But once I started to remember kata, I realized how I could express myself okay. using it. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Good. So <clears throat> you started to get into the, enjoying the kata, the kihon, and mm -hmm. then at that point, did you also become concerned with the grading aspect of it and start to look at it as, okay, I do want to promote and, mm. and move in that direction? To a degree, yes. I mean, I, I was still quite, uh, I never really asked to grade. I, my sensei always just said eventually, you know, it just a couple of years down the line, I think I stirred, stayed at 30 brown belt for like three years. And my sensei just said, okay, Ben, that's it. You, you're grading for Shodan. Yeah. Just next weekend, you're gonna grade for Shodan. Yeah. You know, so get practicing and do that. So, yeah. And I had a buddy that trained as well. Um, so we, it was good we trained together a lot. He was the same age as me, and um, that was really good to see our development yeah. at the same yep. time. Yep. Yeah. So uh, you stayed at this dojo up until the age of what? About uh, 20, 21, okay. until I finished university. Um, all right, so all the way through university, yeah. you continued to train. Mm. Uh, did you compete at that time? No, never competed. My, as, uh, I mean, as I said, I, I did compete a little when I was younger, but really my sensei moved far away from competition. So he never did it. Mm. Why is that? I don't, I don't want you to speak on behalf of your sensei, no, but no, if, no, you no, can, okay. if you can mm -hmm. give some information on why he moved away from the competition. In my opinion, I believe he was trying to make sure that we didn't train in a certain way that would water down. That's not his words, it's just my understanding. The aspect, a self-defense aspect. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure that if, if if it ever came to it, that our karate would be very useful. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it was, it was Shotokan, it was a long distance style of karate, and yeah. it was a, a particular way of fighting, but he didn't want us to be tapping people. Yeah. If, if okay. it ever happened, he wants to, to hurt someone. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. So when you go back home, this is still your home dojo? Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. After mm -hmm. university, or uh, through university, yeah. um, you continue to train there. <clears throat> After university, mm. um, you, you did have a regular day job at some, at some point? <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, well, I mean, during university, I actually worked three jobs during university. Uh, I was studying history, and I still cycled four miles each way to go to the dojo twice a week. So I, you know, I did a lot of hard work there. But when I finished university, I wanted to grow more as a person. Okay, now Aberdeen's quite a small city. Um, I could have, if I wanted to, just gone straight into the oil industry. But I wanted to grow as a person. I had a dream of becoming a poet and a writer and a journalist, so I moved to Edinburgh. You almost so, are. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah, I've almost fulfilled that. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll yeah, do yeah, that. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I moved down to Edinburgh. So I changed clubs at that point, and I started training with the Edinburgh University Shoulder Power okay. Club. All right. Um, you, at some point, ended up leaving home. Yes. Was your first time leaving for karate when you came here? No, actually. Okay, uh, let's, let's go Okay, so I lived in Edinburgh for a couple of years. I met my current girlfriend while living in Edinburgh. She's from Australia. When her visa finished, she went back to Melbourne, and I went with her. Okay. So we moved to Melbourne. Uh, before I got there, she actually looked up two clubs for me to train at. Uh, one was um, a JKA club uh, by Keith Geyer Sensei. Um, he's quite famous, um, a South African sensei who moved out to Australia, and also Stan Schmidt, who's one of the highest ranking uh, non-Japanese uh, JK sensei. And there was another karate dojo which was happened to be 20 minutes north of where I was living at the time in Melbourne, um, a sensei called Edgy, Edgy Zanel, uh, who I'm very fond of. He's a very great sensei, and he was an independent uh, dojo. And because he was only 20 minutes away, that's the one I ended up going to. Independent uh, means he wasn't tied to... He wasn't JK. tied to anything, no. What did he teach? 
Shotokan. Okay. But he had also had a background in JK Karate and also in Kaze Ryuha as well. What is Kaze Ryuha? Kaze Ryuha is a form of Shotokan that was developed by Taiji Kaze, who trained mainly with Gigo Funakoshi, Yoshitaka okay. Funakoshi. So okay. Gichi Funakoshi's son, Gigo Funakoshi, who was perhaps the most influential in how Shotokan has become the way it has. Yep. Okay. Taiji Kaze trained directly with him and um, then he spread it into, into Northern Europe, mainly okay. France and, and the UK. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> How long did you stay in Australia? Two years. That instance. That instance. Mm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> train there that, that period of time mm -hmm. and continue on. I, I know at some point you get to Okinawa, but I don't want to yeah, gloss no problem, over. Yeah. I don't want to gloss over the, in, the information in between. Of course, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. So literally two days after arriving in Melbourne, I went straight to that dojo. I, I started training. Um, I liked the way my the, the Eiji Zanel, when I met him, I liked what he had to say. He understood that karate is karate. You know, just because he uh, teaches it slightly different doesn't mean it's any any better or worse. So it was really good. So I started uh, training with him, um, and it's interesting. He was a lot more focused on not only the hard budo style training, but also in competition. And he really liked kumite competition as well as kata competition. Okay. Um, and he was really technically minded in it when it came to kata. He really, not only did I start enjoying kata, but I really started learning a lot from the kata with his training. Um, so that was my two years. And he also told me, do some competition, do some kata competition, which I did under okay. his request. So. And down in Australia. Yeah, down in Melbourne, yeah. Uh, what was the competition like down there? And you, well, you didn't train, you didn't do a kata competition when you no. were in Scotland. You no. were fighting back yeah. then, but you did kumite in Australia. <clears throat> kumite was uh, a point style. Yeah, point style. Would kumite you call it sundome? Uh, what is? Oh, sundome. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So just a light tap. You yeah. wore a bit of sparring mix and stuff. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shin guards. No, just just gloves. Just gloves. Yeah. No headgear. Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, but yep. in and out. Yeah, and he knew to J it, not through it. He knew JKA rules as well as WKF rules. Um, so, yeah, so he could include a bit of sweeping and all that sort of okay. stuff. Yeah. And he, he's, he, was, uh, inter he was a national coach for the Australian team, um, and he's also won a number of medals and trophies in his lifetime in competitions. So, yeah. Competition can be good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Continue on. Yeah, so um, <laughs> that was really interesting, and I, I still never, I was still never very good at competition, but that's because of nerves and all that sort of stuff. And I still had the mentality that I didn't fully enjoy competition. But while I was with him, I, I graded for Nidan um, with him in in, um, in, Sh in his Shotokan school, and then he also got me ratified with the JKA Shodan and Nidan grades as well, okay. which I'm very grateful for as well, because he did. He then rejoined the JKA. Okay. Not long after, not before I, long before I left. Anyway, so my two years in Australia was coming to an end. Okay, so my girlfriend and I decided to move back to Scotland. Okay, where we were going to study. Uh, she she became a teacher um, in while in Australia. She got her teaching degree, and I was going to go back to Scotland and also get a teaching degree. Okay, uh, my life is very colourful. You're going to learn this. Okay, so. When we got back to the UK, though, we sort of changed our minds about it because she went down to London to teach um, in school, and it really wasn't a system we wanted to get into. A job for her came up in Edinburgh, so we ended up moving back to Edinburgh, and I ended up getting a job with the Edinburgh University. Okay, So we were there for about a year, uh, for about four or three months, actually, and she said to me, Ben, you've got to do something with your karate. You know, you're not doing anything, you're just working, you're just sort of mm. meandering with your training. What are you going to do? And so I made a New Year's resolution. I said, well, do you know what? What year was this? This was in 2014. Okay. 2014, December 2014. So she had a big talk with me. Okay. So I've been reading Jesse and Cam's blog, you know? And I went to his KNX uh, in the August um, of 2000, uh, in 2015. I decided to go to his KNX. I bought a ticket, okay? And on that time as well, I decided, you know, I'm gonna take Jesse and Cam's advice. I'm gonna go to Patrick McCarthy Sensei I'm going to go to Ian Abernethy Sensei, yep. and I'm going to see who else I can train from to broaden my experience. Yep. And it was from that point on that it really whew, opened my mind to the possibilities of what I could do with yeah. my training. So at this point, you you were not blogging yet, and you nope. were not recording any of this. <clears throat> we had talked yesterday, uh, 
yesterday, the day before, um, about healthy lifestyle. Mm. We'll get into more of that, but I want to ask mm. you, were you at this particular time in your life, you were smoking? No, I start, uh, yeah, I was smoking from the age of about 18, 19, so okay. when I started university, till about okay. the age of 21, 22. So you had quit so that just, prior? Yeah. Because I, mm. the, 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 um, I hope when, after people watch this and listen to you, they, they follow your blog and they mm. can um, download your ebook and mm. uh, learn more about your lifestyle and become members of different Facebook groups mm -hmm. that we'll talk about. So I just yeah. wanted to touch on that. Sure. When you started to make these changes, if yeah. it was all one drastic change yeah. or a little bit, by a little bit with the, the lifestyle, mm. like choices. <clears throat> little bit by little bit, and I have to really say my girlfriend's the major catalyst. She didn't like me smoking for a start, so I gave up cold turkey smoking. I took up running instead. Every time I wanted a cigarette, I went running instead. I, I worked hospitality, so smoking yeah. was really part and parcel of life. But I still drank you a lot. You realize that now. Yeah, right? I do, I do. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Like somebody walks up and they smell like an ashtray. Yeah, yeah not good, not good anymore. Uh, but I still drank a lot and I still ate pretty unhealthily as well, okay? Um, and it wasn't until I went to Australia where the culture in Australia is uh, very much geared towards living a healthy lifestyle. They're very much into their sports and being healthy compared to what it's like in Scotland, although it's developing now. And that's what got me onto changing my diet and cutting back on the alcohol as well. Uh, so by the time I come back to Scotland in 2014, um, I really had changed my mentality around what I can eat, what I can consume, and how to take care of my body better. Well, it wouldn't be fair if we didn't talk about how you felt training. After mm. changing your diet, mm. um, and this isn't a health show or health podcast, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. but I think it's extremely important uh, to talk about this and understand it. Mm. What did you start to feel? Did you notice differences? Kata, kumite, mm -hmm. overall? I could tell you that my strength and my, my stamina certainly increased. My spirit never changed. I was always strong, you know, strong-willed uh, in the dojo. But I can tell you now that I noticed the difference if I did consume something that wasn't good for me and or did have drinks beforehand, I could notice the difference of what, how, how much worse it made me feel mm -hmm. in training. Mm -hmm. So the benefits crept in, but you could then notice the difference afterwards. Yep. Okay, um, <clears throat> so you decided to track down Jesse. Yep. You decided to track down Patrick McCarthy. Yep. Ian Abernathy. Yep. Uh, probably three of the most well known names yep. out there uh, that put on some of the best seminars. Um, let's pick up from there. How do okay. We get to where we're at. So, um, Pat, going to Patrick McCarthy's uh, seminar really opened my eyes to seeing how the movement in Kata. Uh, can be various, varied, very varied applications, you know, so many different applications. Yeah. I was like, oh wow, and how there's such depth to kind of practice. Yeah. Going to Ian Abernethy, seeing his passion for looking at the form and seeing how yeah. you can apply it, wow, massive. Yeah. And then when I went to the KNX <clears throat> experience in Frankfurt in 2015, I was, you know, introduced to um, senseis who did Jiu Jitsu or sensei who did um, the world champion uh, of, of sports kumite. And then of course Jesse Enkamp and seeing his passion and meeting up with all these other karate nerds who were all wanting to, to learn outside of the box. Yeah. yeah, blew my mind, like literally. So when I went, I was still living in Scotland, I was training and it was interesting, I would start to go, well, I could keep going to the dojo, which was the Edinburgh University Chodokan Club and it was the classic three Ks, Kihon, Kumite, Kata. Yeah, okay. But it was never more outside of that and there wasn't an advanced class either. So I really just started training by myself at that point. And I started doing yoga, and I started lifting weights. Yeah, so that really okay. changed my karate too. Did, did you pick up yoga and lifting weights from something that one of the other instructors had told you? Nope, um, I literally pick, picked up yoga because my girlfriend, uh, she does yoga, she's also a yoga teacher, and I picked it up massively while I was in Australia. Okay. And the lifting weights part was <coughs> down to reading one of Jesse Enkamp's blogs in regards to weights, you know, lifting weights for supplementary training, and he talked about doing a three by three method. Edinburgh University um, has a really good gym facility, sports facility, and they happen to be doing a course to teach you how the basics do squatting, deadlifting, bench press, etc. I went, hey, 40 pounds, 12 weeks, I'm gonna do it. And yeah, I was hooked on that mm, from then on. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, actually in your ebook, I think, or it was it one of your blog posts that I mm. probably both had read mm -hmm. about uh, you're, uh, you're still a huge fan of the lifting weights and the yoga. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
the squats are a, a big go-to for that's that. That's it, yeah. So, talking about uh, thinking outside the box and what kata can be and what it can't be, the seminar we just attended on Sunday mm. it was very eye-opening as well, it right? Was, yeah, yeah. Um, three and a half hours of nothing but naihachi, mm. and that would probably bore some people to death, but... Mm. And we didn't even get into the legs. That's like you true. Said, right? We didn't even use our legs yet. This yeah, was, I mean, yeah. we did, right? But yeah, it is very interesting to, to be able to uh, move around and train with some different people, different disciplines, jiu-jitsu, judo, whatever, mm -hmm. or even different views within within karate, and start to, to open up the, the different doors. When you were training as a younger younger man mm -hmm. um, in your hometown, mm -hmm. were you was there any other dojos? First of all, or was it pretty much only one in the area? No, there's, there's a few dojos in, in Scotland. Yeah, there's other, a few sensei, yeah. Other Shotokan, or was there... Mainly Shotokan. Okay. Yeah. All right. Was it, was it allowed, or encouraged, or frowned upon to, to visit the other dojos? Frowned upon. Yeah. Okay. Frowned upon, yeah. Yeah, that was a rhetorical question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I feel the same way, actually. Uh, in the States, it was, it was frowned upon, unless it was... Um, and I, and I, I understand reasons behind but mm -hmm. unless it was approved by your sensei, which it should always be, um, because there, there could be history there that you don't know about, right? Or Correct. even a safety issue or ideas that just are going to completely change your, your way of thinking. But yeah. uh, that certainly, it, that happens here a little bit, but it's, it's rare here. Yes, right? it's yeah. Like Okinawa, you know, it's go train. You know? Exactly. Of course, I always still ask my sensei, hey, can I go here? I think I've been told no one time. Mm -hmm. It was for a very good reason. Mm -hmm. All right, so K and X. Yeah. You did the K and X in Frankfurt. Yep. And then I did the K and X as well in um, 2016, the one in London. Okay. As well. Yeah. So. So, talk about that a little bit. Were, were the K and X is drastically different? I've not. I have not attended a K and X. Mm. I've seen videos online. I see some of the guest instructors that Jesse mm -hmm. brings in. Mm -hmm. How different were they? Or how similar were they? The, the, the format, instructors? format is the same. Essentially, there's like three or four instructors, including Jesse, um, and you know you get a taste of what of, of each instructor, their insight into how uh, how either what they do, how it can be applied to karate, or certainly their journey in karate and what how they apply it. You know that sort of thing, and it's and it's it's really good training as well because uh, it's it's a smaller group. So you get time to discuss things and chat about things. And then Jesse also makes sure he does um, a special interest. You know, so the one in Frankfurt, we did Zen uh, meditation, um, Zazen meditation. And the one in um, London, we had a special sports psychology course. Um, so that was really, really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And those are little secret things he, he, keeps, yeah. he keeps hidden and then we turn yeah. up, you know. And, and it's really the openness as well, which is really cool about the KNX experience, yeah. yeah. And you're going to be, you're not going to be attending. I'm not going to this because, one, uh, no. You're leaving in two days to, That's go, right, yeah. to go home. But uh, there's a uh, KNX 18, which is actually here in Okinawa. And this is the first one, I think. It is first the first KNX one in Okinawa. in Okinawa um, next week, mm -hmm. December 26th through the 30th. The 30th, maybe, that's right, like that. yeah. Okay. Um, so after the, after the last two KNXs, mm. you were thinking outside the box. You were continuing your training on your own. That's right, yeah. Go. Okay, so at this time, despite me uh, eating better, um, living a pretty healthy life, training pretty hard, um, my health actually took a turn for the worst during this time. Even though I went to these two KNXs, I also did a 100-mile uh, cycling marathon, overnight cycling trip. I also did the Spartan race, so I was massively into my fitness at this point, but my health took a turn for the worst. I got a skin infection that the doctors at the time misdiagnosed. They gave me steroid cream because they thought it was eczema. They actually made it worse for me. And actually, I'm really lucky. I think about, I think back on it now, there's two things I'm very grateful for, okay? Despite how horrific it was. I mean, I never slept. My skin was in a terrible mess. My energy levels were horrible. Um, you know, and I didn't realize how bad the infection was. But I'm grateful for the experience because not only did it change the way I looked at my health and the way I practiced karate, but it also gave me an appreciation for my health currently and how I live my life now, okay? Um, what I started to do is change. So, you know, I was heavily into my sports and my training and how hard I trained and my diet, but I started to become more holistic in how 
how I did things and my approach to training. Instead of going to the dojo for two hours and sweating, killing myself, you know, as though that's the only way to train, I started to relax a lot more. I started to understand that things didn't have to be hard all the time. And I had to balance my energy levels properly. I essentially uncovered a way of healing myself, right, without, without having to go to the doctors and taking tablets, etc. Which I'm still on that healing journey. It's, it's not noticeable, but there's still parts of it there. Um, but despite that, I was, on the he I, was, I was over the cusp of healing. And I had the opportunity which came up. I saw on one of Jesse's blog posts the opportunity to apply for the Okinawan Karate Nerd Program. Okay? So this had been a full, this was December 2015. Okay? okay? Um, let me get that right. We're in 2018 currently. Yep. So it must have been no, December 2016. Okay? And the opportunity came up and I said, you know, I'm thinking of applying this. I said to my girlfriend, I'm thinking of applying for this. And she's a massive believer in me. She said, Ben, if you apply, you're going to go. You'll be going. You'll get it, right? And I said, oh, really? You know, so I applied. And sure enough, it came through. I got it, you know? And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. So I was still on my healing journey. Um, you know, I, and then, of course, March the 1st, that was what it was stipulated. I should come in March the 1st. Of course, the Karate Kai fan was going to be opening not long after that. So, yeah, I came to Okinawa. And it really catalyzed the things that I started to understand about my healing, about my holistic way of training, about relaxing more. It couldn't have been more perfect to come to Okinawa at that opportunity, because I feel that that is the way they train here. And yeah. Okay, I gotta ask you to back up just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, go for you it. You started, yeah. you mentioned that you were, you were starting to uh, take control of your health before you came here, right? Yes. And you're still doing it, but how? How did you start to do that? What, did you attend different seminars for that? Did you read, did you, what was the deal? Internet. Two hours, uh, I mean, two years of research on the internet. I read so many different sources about different types of weight training, different types of mobility training, different types of diets, how you apply it to yourself, how to use it. I just did mass amount of research. I'm very grateful that my job wasn't too taxing at the time. Um, so I never had to take my work home with me. So I had plenty of opportunity to really like, and of course I had to change my training as well. So instead of doing loads of gym work, I could spend a lot more time at home and really research this stuff. So, so what did you do though? Um, I put things into, in, I tested it. I tested a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. I um, tried this diet, ket uh, ketosis diet, yep. or I would try um, eating fresh fruits and, fruits and vegetables or carb cycling. I just tried everything, you know, and see how it worked yep. for me. You know? Yep, your own little guinea pig. Yeah. Okay. Uh. All right. Um, so, K and, uh, no, not KNX, Okinawa Karate Nerd Program. Yes. Brought you here March of 2017. Yes. Uh, the KaiCon opened up in April of that year, I think it was. No, it was just like, I think it was like, was it still March? March or something? Okay. Yeah. Um, but the official opening day, like, that was when it opened, and then they didn't have, like, the celebration day until about April, I think. Okay. Yeah, coming into the program, mm -hmm. uh, did you have any idea really what you were getting into? Did you, it was your first time to Okinawa yep. coming here? First okay. time. So I had read this uh, on, on Jesse's blog, I think, mm -hmm. somewhere I found out about the karate nerds coming to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And I think you were like the poster boy. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, was, yeah. there, was a, there was a woman, I, there was like two posters I would see the most of. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you came, yeah. There was things about you get to say shingi, you know, or you meet some different people, train with different senseis. So, mm -hmm. when you got here, what did you think? Like, what was your first impression? If you're looking back on it, to Okinawa, man, I don't. Oh, I think my first impression was, wow, there's a lot of karate here. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like Kokusai Dori had the massive, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the yeah, hand yeah, coming yeah, through yeah. the building. I was like, okay, so like even in when they're building things, there's karate here. <laughs> yeah. The Karate Kaikan, it was like custom built dojo yeah, for karate. I was yeah. like, and the museum. I was like, okay, right. So they really love karate here. Yeah, that was my that was my first impression. Yeah. So I, I got to tell you, when I I was living in the states, mm -hmm. uh, when we came back to visit my wife's family in 2013, I felt the same way. It was the first time I came back, and everywhere I looked, I kind of felt the same thing. I could see karate. Everything looked like a dojo to me. Everything mm -hmm. was somehow tied to it. But in reality, it wasn't. And I've had conversations with other people that thought this was going to be like, uh, you know, you read 
see on the internet, you look at a map, Okinawa is so small, right? You're going to mm-hmm. get out the airplane at Naha Airport, and everywhere you walk is going to be a dojo. Yeah, I've had other people say, well, it's really not like that. There's not a McDojo on every corner. That's true. And a lot of them are hid away, or there's this little tiny sign or whatever, you know. Yeah. But uh, I can see your, your first impression did match mine when I came back after mm-hmm. many years as well. Okay, so I, I can understand that, but mm. you got here, and when you were part of that program, were you assigned, uh, being a Shotokan practitioner, were you assigned a certain dojo that, that you could go to, or were you just introduced to multiple senseis? How did that work out? Um, there, James had actually organized a, a Google Maps, and he had um, put on the map uh, quite a lot of dojo that he knew, and a lot of senseis that he knew um, in, in and around this area. Um, and he said, you know, look at it. Before we came, he said, look at this map, check it out, see who you might want to train with. And we could ask James any questions before we arrived as well about, you know, I do Shotokan, what would be a good fit for me, or this is what I particularly want to do. I didn't really have a lot of understanding at that time about, I mean, I understood that Shotokan came from a Shorin system, but really I was just coming with a very open mind. So I was quite happy to go, hey, James, where are we going? Let's check out this. And then I think my first experience was, Basically, I think the day I arrived, or the day after I arrived, it was the day after I arrived, James took me up to his dojo and um, with Arakaki Sensei. Mm-hmm. So that was my very first experience in Okinawa, was uh, Matsubashi okay. Shorin Ryu. Okay. Yeah. And, and when you were here as part of the Karate Nerd program, did mm-hmm. you train mostly at that dojo, or did you bounce around and ex- explore and experiment with mm. different types of styles? Well, interestingly, so James obviously took me up to that, to, to Arakaki Sensei's dojo, and then he explained to me, well, if I wanted to keep training there, I was quite happy to do that. He was able to take me, and of course I could sign up and become a member, etc. At the time as well, there was also the other karate nerds that were joining on the program, so as a group, we would also go up to different senseis. We went up to Higa Sensei's dojo in Yomitan. Uh, we also went to um, Uechi uh, Sensei's dojo, who does Ishin Ryu. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, we went to quite a, quite a number <laughs> A number of different dojos through James, of course, mm-hmm. you know, so that was really cool. I was still on my healing journey at the time, okay. Now, because of the humidity here, my skin actually went a little bit haywire. Um, I don't need to go in the ins and outs on why it is. If anybody is interested, if they have eczema and they want to ask me, feel free. Yeah. I, I feel pretty knowledgeable on the subject now. But because I lived in Tomigusuku, I lived literally across the road from the Kaika, I, I noticed that um, Akimini Sensei's dojo. The Shimbukan was just 20 minutes walk down the road. So I emailed Jesse, I messaged him, and I said, hey Jesse, what do you think of Akimini Sensei's dojo? You know, is it a pretty good fit for me to go there, you know? And he said, definitely. He's a great sensei, you should definitely go there. Um, you know, yeah. For, for, were you thinking weapons at this time? Just or karate. Just empty hand? Yeah. Just karate. Okay. I came here mm-hmm. not really wanting to do kobudo, funnily yeah. enough. Because I, I thought, mm, do I have the time to do kobudo? It's a whole other system I've got to learn, and I really, I love karate so much, you know what I mean? But it turns out, Akimini Sensei's dojo, just down the road, he's famous for doing kobudo as well. Not so famous for his karate, but his karate's really good, okay? And I noticed that I could pay just the, the, the monthly membership fee, I could just pay that fee, and I could come to both trainings. I could come to the karate and the kobudo. So four times a week I could come training. I thought, well, that's really convenient for me. I might as well do that. Yep. So, yeah. So, uh, you were here for how long before you made that connection? Uh, I think about three weeks. Two oh, okay. Weeks. Yeah, so it wasn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, talk us through, tell, tell my, me and the listeners, how did you go about requesting that permission for Akimini Sensei? Uh, I typed in uh, Ryukyu Kobudo, I think it was, or Akimini Sensei, and then his website came up. He's got a website in English. And he actually has a messaging service on there. Okay. So I literally just went, clicked on the message, and I just typed in, hey, is it okay for me to come training on this night, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, he messaged back saying, yeah, okay, I'll see you then. And then he was waiting for me, and I arrived at the dojo, and out to the store, and he said, hi, how are you coming? And, <laughs> that, was and that was it. Wow. Yeah, so, wow. Yeah. And, you mm-hmm. know, before you did that, before you came, did you hear any, any different stories about how to get, how to get introduced to the dojos in Okinawa? No. Okay. I, my only experience was I had this slight notion that, uh, oh, when you go to a different country, for instance, Japan, you need to have a letter of recommendation or you need to be introduced or you need to make sure you've got your permission lined up. But it's interesting, I never considered that that would be an issue because I had been provided this program, the yeah. Okinawa yeah. program, I thought to myself, oh, maybe I don't, 
it's, it's all going to be organized for me. And I understood that James was also going to look after a lot of things for me. Yeah. So really, I was a bit more casual about yeah. it. It was yeah. okay. You know, I, I've heard stories about that as well, letters. And I think that's good to have something like that, especially if you're coming over here and you don't have any connection, mm. which everybody has a connection now through James and through the Tycon, right? Mm -hmm. But even five years ago, 10 years ago, you, you didn't, 20, 30 years ago, you didn't. But mm -hmm. I would hear stories about, you know, you could never be allowed in the dojo, yeah. or especially as an American. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's places like that on the island. Yes. Um, but, boy, that's not my experience. No. <laughs> you know, in the majority of cases, they, I find the sensei are so welcoming that they will, they love having people from all over yep. the world come to their dojo. Yep. You know, and they love sharing what they what yep. they know. Very sharing yeah. community. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Okay, so I'd like to talk more about your sensei. Yeah. Um, very well known for weapons. Mm -hmm. Not as well known for karate, but mm -hmm. that was uh, mainly what you went through, went for in the beginning. What style of karate does he teach? Uh, Kobayashi Shorin Ryu. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's compare that to Shotokan. Okay, let's talk about similarities, differences, what you feel, what you don't feel, what you like, what you don't like. Yeah, awesome. So it was interesting that um, I picked him specifically because I knew there was a slight connection with Shotokan, mainly through the Kogoro element, Taira Shinkan Sensei. His sensei, when he was in Japan, before he did Kogoro um, and, and started Ryukyu Kogoro system, he learned from Ken Mamabuni and Kitchen Funakoshi. And one of his main students was Akamini Hiroshi's father, Ace Cave Akamini Sensei. Yep. Okay, so I thought there must be a bit of a connection there. And sure enough, when I went there, I mean, Akamini Sensei was showing me, you know, some basic kihon and stuff from his system. I noticed very straight away that it was much more natural. Yep. Okay, he said, you don't need to tuck the elbow in, you know, you, you can let it out and uh, be more relaxed. Like with a punch. With, with ski, yeah. Mm. So he's, he's very naturally minded, mm. you know, it, this holding it, holding the elbow in is, uh, is tension in the body. Mm. He's much more relaxed and just let it go. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the video, that's you'll see it in the video. <laughs> um, and then he said, "Oh, do you know Pinan Shodan, Pinan Nidan?" I said, "Well, I do Shotokan. I know the Heian Katas." And he said, "Okay, you try, you try." Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too difficult for me to just translate it. You know, the stances were higher, more natural. I just had to relax more. He showed me slight differences in how the fist is done and that sort of thing, but. Really, um, it wasn't too hard a transition for me, I felt. Okay. You know. And then we did the advanced katas. Tasai Sho in the Kobayashi Shorin system is Basai Dan in Shotokan. And it wasn't too difficult to translate that okay. either. So. Oh, that was good. That's yeah. interesting that uh, he... So even when the punch, he's not so concerned about the elbow being... Not so concerned. Down, but in your Shotokan days, elbows down. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, okay, so this is interesting. So in the Shotokan system, you obviously, you, you keep the elbow pressed backwards and tight yeah. against your body. And when yeah. you throw the ski, you keep it pressed against your body yeah. as it comes out and they twist at the end. Okay. okay? Yeah. But Akimini Sensei, yes, at the end of the punch, the elbow is down. Yeah. Okay. And then with the alignment with the fist, but he's not so concerned about flaring the elbow out when you, okay. when you, but punch. at the end, the elbow, at the end, the elbow is down. I got you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, that's a little bit different. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. The concept yeah. of the elbow can be out. Okay? Yeah. Because usually it's, for everybody elbow down. Yeah. All right, so the the transition not really wasn't much of a transition for no. you. Not for me, but maybe I'm maybe I'm different. Maybe I'm, you know, lucky in that yep. regard. Yeah. Um, but the weapons. Mm. You did not do any weapons. No kobodo leading up no to this. At all. Never picked up a bow, never nope. picked up a sai, tunfa. Nope. You, you had no interest. Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, how long were you training there before you took an interest? Were you were you told, encouraged? made the decision on your own to do weapons? Uh, essentially, the day that I turned up to do karate, Del Hamdi Sensei was also there at the time, um, who, who's at Uchideshi. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for those who have been on the island have met Del Sensei. Um, Fabulous you know, he's, man. Yeah, exactly. Great, great he speaks guy. so many languages, yeah. so he's great to have a yeah, dojo. Yeah, he's a walking translator. He said, you know, you, you paid this money as a guest sensei, as, as a guest, you know, to come, you know, come to the Kubudo class, check it out tomorrow. The Kobudo Sensei was like, yeah, come, come to Kubudo. You know, so I said, okay, I'll come. I'll come and try, you know? And he, Adele was saying, you know, Akimini Sensei's karate, he puts it into his kobudo yeah. and vice versa. So you should definitely try it and just have a look. And that was it. When I turned up and I did it, and I could see the way Akimini Sensei moved with the bow, I was hooked already. Okay. I, I could see, 
why I would like to keep, keep training. Okay. In Kabul. So you started picking up the weapons then and going through that. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but al although you could see it mm -hmm. in his in his uh, kata, in yeah. his kobra, you could see it. Was it difficult for you, or did it, was it did it come rel relatively natural? I would say I probably picked it up quicker than a lot of a lot of people might have done. Um, I think only just because I could understand how to apply my karate training to Kobra, yeah. and because I could understand the way Akimini Sensei was moving with his karate, and what he was trying to accomplish with his Kobudo. Okay. But it was still a learning curve. It was still a steep learning curve initially to get over, um, especially with being relaxed, because obviously you've got and a bow in your hands, and it's, yeah, it's yeah. a bit of weight, you know, yeah. and the, the, the inclination is to, to try and use your muscles. Yeah. And, um, but I'm very lucky that I had Del Hamby Sensei, because at the time of year as well, it was quite quiet. I would have two hours of, you know, dedicated one-on-one -on -one practice with him. And he would say, okay, let's just practice Shomanuchi for two hours, yeah. you know, just keep practicing, you know, and then, so, yeah. It was a steep learning curve, but I also had the mindset at the time, yes, this is new to me. Yes, I don't fully understand it, but I know if I just keep training, keep trying, yeah. keep listening, eventually it yeah. starts to click. Yeah. Well, you were, you put the pieces, uh, uh, you know, you, you laid the foundation to get to where you were, but then, yeah. boy, the doors that opened for you were fantastic. And like you said, the timing with, with Del Sensei, Del Hemi Sensei being there, and Nakamine Sensei just welcoming me in, yeah. um, that's golden, yeah. that opportunity, and you didn't, so, and you didn't piss it away. No. You know, thank God, right? Yeah. So, so this was March of 2017. You got yes. here. You stayed for how long was your visa when you were here training? It was. I got. I got the uh, working holiday visa. Uh, so I had a full one year. I could stay here, but I only stayed for nine months. Okay. In the end, yeah. Still. Mm -hmm. So after nine months, you went back home. I went to my girlfriend's uh, parents for Christmas. Uh, they, they're Australian. Yep. They had just moved house in Australia, so they invited us over for Christmas. Yep. I mean, roughly the same hemisphere. I mean, yes, Australia's in the southern hemisphere, but it's not too far yep. to get to. So we went to Australia for Christmas yep. first. And yeah. it was uh, it's still in Melbourne? Uh, they had moved to an area called Coffs Harbour, which is halfway between Brisbane and Sydney. Okay. For anybody who knows Australia, it's a massive country. So yeah. being halfway between those two, it's still a big distance yeah, between, yeah. but it's a beautiful tropical area to experience yeah. it. So, yeah. Okay, and <clears throat> you've been, okay, you left, went down there for Christmas, yeah. you bounced around a little bit, I followed you online, you, you've been to different seminars as a co-instructor. Yes. Um, yeah. You've held your own seminars, did I, I see? I did, yeah. yeah. Where, where have you held them? And also, if there's any coming up that we can talk about. Okay, so um, I was very lucky, in fact, um, I, just before August, in July, I actually had to go out to Scotland for my best friend's wedding. I was their best man. And then I came back with my girlfriend. She came back over with me in August of, of 2017. And that's when they held the, um, I always did World Karate International. No. <laughs> yeah. Kobodo. It was the World Tournament and then with politics and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first it wasn't international. The, that's right, yeah. It wasn't the world tournament in 2018, it was the 2017, what was it? You know, where, where people still come and they train Kobudo and do a bit of karate. It wasn't the first one, it was like number 36, I think it was. Uh, training or set, uh, tournament? It was just training. Oh, uh, um. And then people would pay, they would do Kobudo with various different sensei that they picked. Oh, okay. And then there was a demonstration. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. What's yeah, that yeah. called? I can't remember. One of the internet, or one of the... Yeah, I know. There's so many of them, right? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. I, I community sense asked if I could help instruct I got during you. that. So okay. that was really good. So I got a little bit of a taste of helping do Kobudo there. Yeah. Okay, so when we went, when in December, we went to Australia for Christmas, um, we decided to go down to Melbourne in... February or March, I think it was March, and I got in touch with my, my sensei from, from Melbourne, and I said, hey, I, A, I would love to come train with you again, just for, you know, while I'm there down for a week, and he said, no problem, Ben, come along, of course you're always welcome, and I said, also, if it's okay, I would love to be able to show what I learned in Okinawa, you know, a bit of the Muken Kai, Shorin Ryu Karate, from Akimini Sensei, as well as the Kobudo, and he said, of course, mm -hmm. so yeah, I held a seminar, and I tried to show how Shotokan and Shorin Ryu, how you can see the similarities, yeah. you know, instead of looking at differences, the similarities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What do you think, was it well received? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, I did. There was only about I think there was about uh, eight people there in yeah. total, but it was great to see we had um, long-standing black belts. One guy who's Goju Ryu, yeah. a guy who's done Shotokan all his life, and we had two uh, people who had, who hadn't done Shotokan for very long. But it was really good to introduce yeah. you know that to them, and I I got really good feedback. That's for good. It. So, That's yeah. good. They opened their mind as well. Mm -hmm. Short time in Australia, then you you've been uh, you bounced around Europe a little bit. Yeah, uh, some different seminars. Well, I'll, I'll tell you where I went actually. Um, Australia is an expensive country, as everyone well knows, and I, I wasn't willing to go back to a nine to five job. Okay, now what I was starting to do was to write my blog and to try and promote the teaching of karate. Okay, this is where I wanted to, and, and my health service as well. This is where I wanted to to earn my living, as it were. Okay, okay. this is my passion, and I had organized a Kubudo seminar in Glasgow okay. in June, back yep. in Scotland, yep. okay? I so I had this yeah. period of three months where my girlfriend and I were like, well, Australia's expensive. We don't really want to be also going back to the UK too early as well because also it's expensive and cold. Halfway there would have been Bali, okay? Now, originally my girlfriend said, you know, let's take a week, go to Bali for a week, okay, in Indonesia, just for a holiday. But we ended up staying for three months, yeah? Because it's a beautiful place to be. That's right. Yeah. Because, okay, I was mm -hmm. going on a business trip to Malaysia. Yes, right. And yeah, I yeah. was pinging you and said, hey, are you still in this neck of the woods? I'm yeah, going to, yeah. yeah. And then I was telling you about doing the podcast, right? And you yeah. had already left. I said, well, I can shoot down to Bali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, okay. totally. If no one's ever been to Bali, you should go. It's almost like Okinawa, just slightly different. Yeah. Same, same but different. Yeah. <laughs> Economical, they say. Yeah. All right. Uh, you, you mentioned your blog, and this is where I want to. I want to really wanted to get to this. Yeah, cool. You have this interesting name, the Kilted Karate Cop. Yeah. I want to know where that came from mm -hmm. when you started that, and let's talk about your blog and how mm -hmm. people can find you online and projects you're working on mm -hmm. now, and what's what's going to be coming up in the future. Okay. So I think my girlfriend and I still uh, are unsure as to who exactly came up with the idea, but I think one night we're in bed, and I think it just came up. It just worked. The Kilted Karate Cut, and this is actually before I came to Okinawa. Um, the Kilted Karate Cut, it was like, nobody else is doing it. I can wear a kilt, thankfully, because I'm Scottish, you know, so that's pretty cool. And I love karate, it's right? Exactly. That's my passion, right? And uh, she was really the driving force behind saying, you know, Ben, you should be writing about this. You should be getting your blog on the go. You've always wanted to be a writer, so go for it. Um, and it took me a while uh, to really get going when I arrived in Okinawa to get that organized. I got the Facebook page set up. So it's easy to find me on Facebook, The Kilted <coughs> Karate Cup, okay? Um, then she got my blog set up. She did all the design work for me, and then I did a lot of the content. So thekiltedkaratekup.com, that's my website. And then, of course, I got the Instagram as well, and then I got the, um, what's the other one, Twitter also yep. as well, which I don't really pay too much attention to. But um, I remember hearing from Jesse that social media is a really important aspect. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you, if you want to be connecting to people, yeah. That's really important to have. Well, it's easy enough to link your Instagram and your Twitter together. And yeah. That way the posts are there too, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, so the Kilted Karate Guy, Facebook.com for your yeah. blog, yeah. Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a, it's pretty interesting. There's pictures of you out, I guess, in the woods in Scotland. Yeah, we did that in February. The, the month before, just a few weeks before I left, to come, le uh, left Scotland to come to Okinawa, my girlfriend organized a photo shoot for us up in the... Um, you're the Highlands of Scotland. February, man. It was so cold, but <laughs> we did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far cry from Okinawa and Bali. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Along the lines of your, your health journey and, and mm. this interest, you've also created another Facebook group. Yes. It's the Karate Fit group, okay? I noticed there was a small... Uh, there's, there's a lot of karate groups out there on Facebook now, as you'll know. Mm -hmm. So many. Traditional karate group here, or the JK yeah. karate group, or the Ryukyu Karate Research Society, for yeah. instance. You know, Karate Nerds, which is a massive branching yeah. uh, one, which is great, you know. But I noticed there was a bit somewhere lacking, especially with what I was doing with my health and my practice. There was a little bit lacking in using modern exercise techniques like barbell training, um, yoga training, for instance, and mobility training really specifically designed for karateka, okay? You either had the hojo ando, you know, fanatics in one, one area, mm -hmm. or you had the guys who were mainly doing gym work, which was, you know, you can go online, you can find any gym routine for, for a lot of athletics, 
never really traditional karate cut. It's either sporting karate cut or it's a total different sporting method, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, well, what if you don't want to be an athlete? What if you don't want to be massively muscular? You know, what if you just want to have better, you know, more power, better health, and you don't want to spend all your time in the, tr in, in the gym? You know, you still want to practice karate, yep. right? That's where I was at. So I thought, karate fit, okay? Doesn't mean to say it's traditional karate fit, doesn't mean it's sporting karate fit. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I'm a member of that group, thank you. Uh, there's been some, some good posts in there. Mm. Um, different ideas for health and fitness and training. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, when I interviewed uh, uh, Jesse Enkamp when he was here in August, he came for the international tournament. That's I right, posted yeah. in, in your Facebook group yeah. that, hey, he's coming, and I had some questions mm. sent my way for him, so that worked out mm -hmm. well, good way to network. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, people can find you online at uh, tiltedkaratika.com, yep. Facebook, Instagram, Karate Fit. Yep. I want to wrap it up here with just a few sure. questions. Um, I want some input and, and advice from you for people that are coming to Okinawa that have a desire to come to Okinawa, mm -hmm. but they might not have a, a home dojo, they might mm -hmm. not have a connection. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? Oh, wow. Um, I would say, well, go on Facebook, message on the Karate Nerds group, or even um, the Karate Fit group, because there's quite a few people on there who, who have been to Okinawa. Get in touch with either Jesse Enkamp as well, and James Pankovic, okay? And so you now you've got a number of sources, you can just ask questions. When you come to Okinawa, you can go to the dojo bar. Of course, you're generally always gonna meet somebody yeah. who's either been in the island quite a number of times, or who lives on the island, um, and they can give you a lot of good advice, you know? There's that. Or, go online, try and find, uh, try and find a dojo that you can then message. Or if you see a dojo on the street, find the opening times. Turn up on the day, on the day or the night, knock on the door and ask if you can train. And just go from there, you know? You never know who you'll meet, you'll never know who, you, who you'll talk to. And it may not even be the dojo that you then are set for life in. You might go to, one sensei and you might train there a couple of weeks but you might meet somebody else who says come as a guest and meet my other sensei you know and that's cool do that right and then you might go oh this actually works better for me mm -hmm. no problem yeah that was probably that's probably my advice okay yeah if that makes sense if, if i'm if i'm making sense uh, it makes sense it, yeah number one place i would recommend for people is just yeah. the dojo bar, the dojo bar <laughs> yeah i mean you walk in there on any any given day or yeah. message james but of course and um, the people the staff behind the bar as well they, they're uh, training amazing. often as well it's an know. international hub it yeah. really is yeah um what's uh i'm putting you on the spot here what's one or two things people should not do when they come to okinawa if they want to train mm. okay be honest okay don't go to one sensei and then say, oh, I'm only gonna train with you, and then go train with another sensei. Be honest, say, I wanna train as a guest. I still want to see what other sensei are doing. Is that okay, okay? So be very honest with them. Usually, they're quite all right with that, especially when you're beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, you can do a guest class and do a guest class here and a guest class here. Not a problem. Um, another thing not to do is, um, don't turn up with just your black belt wear a white belt, you know, just a sign of respect. Yep. You know, you're a beginner, you're always a beginner when you come to a new dojo. Yep. You know, it doesn't matter if you've done the style before. Yep. Yeah, you're always a beginner. Good, two very good <laughs> yeah. bits of advice. Yeah, another one, uh, another good advice, put money in an envelope, in an envelope uh, for giving the money. Yeah, and, okay. yeah. Uh, how much? What's a, uh, what's a nominal that, that you would recommend? 3,000 seems yeah. to be, seems yeah. to be the, the figure. Yeah. Yeah, it's some uh, sense they don't accept it, some yeah. sense they won't Most less. of them are going to tell you no, um, yeah. and you just continue to give it, continue and, to give and it, they're yeah. going to take it. So I, mm -hmm. I tell people when they come, a uh, rule of thumb is three to five. Yeah. Three or five, not four. Three yes. or 5,000 yen, because mm -hmm. that is a, a common monthly fee. Yeah. And I've had people say, well, if I'm going to be here for two or three weeks, do I have to pay that every time I come? If, I, if I'm going to visit two times, you know, typically, no, you pay one time. That's right. If you're going to be here for a month, the sensei's not going to keep asking you. Or... You don't feel comfortable going to the sensei, find out who the top student is, one of the other black belts, and ask them, they'll set you straight. But that's right. 3,000 yen, 5,000 yen, is, that's a that's good right. rule of thumb. And if you're coming from Europe, I don't know what it's like in America, but if you're coming from Europe, that is very cheap. It's okay. very cheap. <clears throat> and in often that's actually how much sometimes private lessons are as well. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I personally feel that Sensei should charge more, but I can understand how accessible it is for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not um, designed, and I shouldn't say it's not designed. Mm -hmm. Intended. It's not intended to be your source of income. No. Nope. Your primary source of income. That's right, yeah. Um, the vast majority of the senseis have a day job. That's right. Um, and some of them don't even have their own dojo. I, we, I just had lunch. I was, that's why I was late getting here. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, five that's ten minutes late because I was eating lunch with Shimabuko Sensei's uh, Zenpo, mm -hmm. and we were talking about that and money. And it's most of them don't have a dojo until they're forty or fifty years old. They're yeah. already well established in their career, and then in their retirement years, it's it right, yeah. their only sort. Well, retirement meaning that source of income, but it's not how they pay the bills. No. In America, it's it's different. I think that's right, probably yeah. is as well. And that's <coughs> they say, but that's why you get the McDojos because they have to make money. Yes, they have yeah. to pay the insurance. Right. Keep the lights on, so they have to have their birthday parties and mm -hmm. every other thing going on. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in Okinawa, typically. No, no, that's um, true. Any last closing thoughts? My last closing thought, actually, is in relation to what you just said. Okay, I feel that uh, karate now is so widespread. Okay, and it has it has a lot. You know, it's all around the world. Okay, various types of karate. That I feel that. In order to make money from karate, it doesn't have to be a McDojo. There is another way of doing it. Um, I don't believe it's about having a, la a large space and having many students to keep things running. I think you can manage with a smaller space and with fewer students, but perhaps do more one-on-one -on -one time. I also feel that I'm very grateful for the previous generation of, of um, karateka in Okinawa who have had to split their time between the day job their family life, which is obviously very expected of them, and running a dojo, which often can be like a full-time job, yeah. you know? And yes, you, you mentioned when they're in the retirement, that's when they, ha they have the opportunity to spend more time on their dojo and spend more time training. I feel that perhaps there needs to be a slight shift, especially for the new generation that are coming through, who often have to work long hours, have a family, and then try and retain the information from the previous generation that could easily be lost if they don't train. Perhaps there could be a way of changing it so that perhaps us foreigners who come over could pay more to have people who in the dojo who don't have to spend time on their day jobs. I'm not saying they have to make a profit or make lots of money from karate, but enough so that they can get by where they can spend more time learning Remembering, you know, retaining that information so it doesn't get lost and passing it on. That's All my right. closing thoughts. That's awesome, my man. Ideas. I appreciate it. Yeah. Ben, thank you so cool. much. It's great to see really you. Really happy to see you. Yeah, yeah, great to no see you. Yeah. If you got time, let's do some coffee. Yeah, we'll do. I know you got class tonight, but mm. we have the room here. Yeah, we should definitely so do some coffee. Awesome, yeah. man. I really cool. appreciate it. Okinawa cool. Karate cool. Podcast. Thank you very much.